Hey there, Jonathan Golko here. Welcome back to the sound booth at Studio 1405. Our journey into the realms of sonic resonance continues with a look at the science of mixing audio. Sound effects such as EQ, compression, distortion, reverb, delay, phasers, flangers, and stereo imagers can take a dull or dynamic recording and change the color of its tonal properties. Now let's be clear, no amount of mixing can fix a bad recording. It could definitely doctor up a sketch of an idea and help craft a sonic vision for your song, but mixing as a process is more like adding seasoning to a meal. It can't make the food any fresher. It can only mask the blandness or low quality of a dish. But if you add the right mix of seasonings to a super fresh plate, then you're really cooking. Film composer Thomas Newman refers to this philosophy as the spice rack. In media composition, the writer will orchestrate a piece of music specifically for a motion picture. They'll use instruments of the orchestra or their synth library as a kind of spice rack that can give different flavors to a scene depending on which they use. For example, Darth Vader's theme by John Williams would sound very different if instead of being underscored by some punchy, aggressive low brass, it was played by short staccatos by a bunch of bassoons. As a mixing engineer, the spice rack philosophy becomes the use of sound effects or plugins to add flavors and balance to the freshly made recording. This is a deep subject with hours of detailed histories, evolutionary scientific development and applications, mind-blowing methodologies, and the ability to enhance or totally destroy a piece of music. Today, we're only going to scratch the surface of this fascinating area of music production as it pertains to our track of Moonlight Sonata. But we'll take a look at some of the plugins we have available here at Studio 1405 and be able to review some helpful resources that are out there on the internet who do real deep dives into the art of mixing. So let's dig back into our track and take a look at how to use a few plugins to enhance the sound of our classical duet. Okay, back in Pro Tools, here on the left we have the mix window and on the right the edit window. I'm going to pull these over and make some space for our plugins that we'll be looking at here in the middle. We can see we've already selected a piece of the song that we'll use as a loop for our mixing example. So let's go ahead and start with the bass clarinet. We left off in the last episode, we were looking at hitting this negative 10 as a sweet spot in terms of our gain staging. Okay, so it's not to say that this negative 10 dB that's our sweet spot is a hard number. It's not a hard rule. So what we're looking for out of this number is basically an average for where the cleanest audio will resonate from without clipping or distorting. We're approaching this from the songwriter, from the home producer, who is making a piece of music that will eventually go on to a mix engineer and a mastering engineer. What we want to do is be able to make sure that we leave enough headroom for additional loudness that mix and master engineers will be able to add, which will help amplify the track's overall perceivable sound. So again, our goal here with aiming for this negative 10, this is going to give us a nice sweet spot that we can balance our whole track on, at least as a target level, and then use the human ear to find that next balance. We don't want to over push the entire track, right? So we want to make sure that we're doing the best work we can to prepare our music for the next level, which goes on to the mixing and mastering engineer. So we had had these levels gain staged pretty well in the last video. Now let's take a listen again and see where everything's hitting and see if we need to make any adjustments. I'm going to keep this here. I'm going to hold shift and hit the EQ so we can take a look again at our reductive EQ that we used in that last example. We used this reductive EQ to cover up some of the piercing harshness of a plastic bass clarinet. So where it was hitting a bit high in terms of 2 kilohertz, we were able to pull that harshness down a bit using this reductive subtractive EQ method, which then gave a little bit of warmth. But we're not done there because we want to add even more body to this sound to make it sound even more impressionable and even more live and present to us as a listener. So let's take a look at this again. We brought this frequency down at 2 kilohertz at negative 6 dB. This pulls away from the overall volume as well, which means we are going to have to push it back up a little bit. So we had the trim reader here, so we had our natural raw audio hitting at this negative 10. Now we also have another volume reader here. When we're listening back to this loop, let's see if these are all hitting at negative 10. If not, we can make some adjustments to the input and output to make sure that they are perfectly balanced.
So this is going to give us a good starting place. We'll be able to make some adjustments as we go along, because as we adjust some of the volume of the piano or of the bass clarinet, the other one will need some adjustments. As we're adding more plugins, we're going to be doing the same thing, because as you add an EQ, it may change the sonic spectrum of the sound, which means another alteration may be needed down the road. And this kind of happens when we start stacking effects. So we may find that once we add a compression, we'll make some adjustments to the bass clarinet based on what we do to the piano and vice versa. Right now, we're just looking at this bass clarinet. We're going to add a few more effects to get a little bit more of a warmer, bigger bodied sound, as well as adding some compression, which will give us a little bit more loudness and presence from the sound, even though this is a gentle piece of music. So it's a very cool effect that's really useful for being able to take a nice, intimate, almost like a whisper tone, and make it sound like it's very present in the ear. And this is going to be a wonderful effect that we'll be able to add onto a piece like this that is so introspective and emotional, but with a huge dynamic range. So we'll be able to use a compressor to help bring out some of that life without squashing it. So we've done our reductive, we're hitting 10, everything's sitting pretty well here. Let's go ahead and add another effect. We're gonna go here into the effects channel now. So we'll go back to the top, multi-channel plugin, and now we're looking at adding the EQ, or do we go to these dynamics, do we add a compressor? Depending on which engineer you talk to, you're gonna get a different answer on this one. There is no correct answer as to which one EQ or compression comes first. I would say that it has to come down to the application and context of the instrument within the piece of music. What we're going to be getting out of Moonlight Sonata is a really great example between this live bass clarinet and the MIDI piano. Each one has its own presence and its own color palette, so we want to find out ways to accentuate that without oversaturating the other instrument. So in this case, when we're looking at the bass clarinet, I'm going to go ahead and do EQ first. Now let's go ahead and add another EQ37 band. This is a stock plugin that comes in with Pro Tools. We'll keep an eye on both of these, but we'll look at this one on top for the moment. So if we return to the frequency spectrum infograph here from Musician on a Mission, we can look at the lower end of the spectrum here. We're looking at the bass and the low mids. Right here where we get this warm, full, and punchy, clear sound, this is our next goal for the bass clarinet. We've already reduced some of this nasal harsh piercing that comes from the plastic clarinet by making a dip pretty wide in the filter here around 2 kilohertz and even getting up into 5 kilohertz. And so now that we've reduced some of that harshness, we have the opportunity to add some of that warmth back here down on the low end. When using a professional quality clarinet, these are made of wood. That gives them a much more natural warmth and full-bodied sound. What we're going to be doing here by using the plastic clarinet, as well as the EQ plugins and Pro Tools, is we're going to be able to manipulate our raw audio and try to get it to sound as close to a professional model clarinet by using some of these post-production techniques. So when we're looking at the frequency spectrum, we're going to be aiming for this area here with the warm and full. So we're going to be looking at about 200 hertz, and we're going to be adding a few dB here. So let's go ahead and take a look at that now. We're going to play the loop. I'm going to mute the piano for a moment so that we can just hear what this is going to sound like. But keep in mind, we don't want to be working all of these effects with other instruments on mute. We do want to bring them in so we hear how the changes we're making fit against those other instruments. And hopefully, if they're working together, they will be fitting with them rather than against them. But then again, every single change we make in terms of one effect to another, we always want to think about that full context. So let's go ahead and play this loop, and we'll be making some adjustments down here right around 200 hertz. Nice. So what we did was we raised the volume here just over 7 dB, almost 8 dB. I chose to keep the filter on a little bit more of a narrow bell curve here so that we didn't bleed into too many of these other frequencies that could have ended up muddying up the sound and contrasting against some of these other frequencies that will be covered in our piano part. And you may also notice that as we increase the volume of a frequency here in the EQ, it also responds to the output. So we need to be conscious that as we increase or decrease volume in our EQ, that we're also compensating for those input outputs so that whatever sound leaves this effect, it's going to be hitting at our same sweet spot, at our same target. So taking a listen one more time, we're going to make sure that this is hitting at negative 10. 
And let's go ahead and bring that trim tool back in so that we can see the entire chain working in its proper order. So we'll bring these up here. So our order becomes trim, reductive EQ, and an EQ boost. We're looking for a negative 10, negative 10, negative 10. Again, this isn't a hard rule. This is just going to be a nice natural volume level that'll give us plenty of opportunity to push that volume with loudness later when we're adding compression, or even to keep that headroom low so that when we pass this thing off to a proper mix engineer or mastering engineer, they'll be able to have plenty to work with without us having to re-record or remix anything on our end. So taking a listen, let's see where we're at. <laughs> All right, so now that we've got those set, let's go ahead and bring that piano back in. This is the part where we want to compare the work we just did to the piano. It's all fine and well to work with one instrument soloed, but the thing is, once we've made these adjustments to EQ, we may find that they end up bleeding and clashing against these frequencies from other instruments. So we want to make sure that we then play again with the track and make any kind of tweaks we need, because while this may sound nice and full-bodied here while it's just playing by itself, once we add the piano back in, we may find that that boost we made is actually conflicting with some of the frequencies found in the piano. Cool, I'm happy with that. Let's move on to the compression. I'm gonna close these for now so that we have a blank space that we can work with. Back here to our inserts, we're going to the multi-channel plugin, we go to dynamics. So let's get into the compressor. So I wanna go down here to our compressor. This is a plugin from the Waves Audio Bundle, R Comp, or Renaissance Compression. So the point of this video series isn't to be a deep dive into all of these plugins. There are plenty of videos out there on YouTube, start with Musician on a Mission. When we're doing something specific to Waves Audio, they have plenty of videos that go well in depth on how to use all of these plugins that they have provided. And here in Studio 1405, we have the Waves Audio Bundle. So we're gonna be doing a mix between stock plugins that come with Pro Tools, as well as this third-party supplier, Waves. So this is a compressor I've been using for a while now, and I really like it. So it's pretty simple to use. Again, we're not gonna be going into the full depth of what this plugin is actually doing, but I'm just gonna show how we can take some of the dynamics of our instruments and start pulling them in so that they are going to be perceivably louder, but they're not gonna be squished. We wanna make sure that they're gonna have a nice, breathable dynamic level, but they're going to appear louder and be able to give us a much clearer sense of where this volume is. What we're gonna do is start with the bass clarinet. We're gonna go ahead and keep the piano playing on as we're doing this so that we can hear how the bass clarinet fits with the piano in real time. I'm gonna do a little bit with the threshold here, playing around with the gain. We've got the attack, release, and the ratio. So let's take a listen. I'm gonna make some adjustments and see if you can hear this volume perceivably increase while we keep an eye on our meter here for that same digital VU of negative 10. Let's take a listen. So you may notice that the bass clarinet still has this dynamic range where it has its crescendos and its decrescendos. But the thing is, by using this compressor, we've actually wrangled in some of those outlier dynamics 
So the dynamics appear to be flexing, but at the same time, we're being able to boost those frequencies without overdriving the entire sound. Kind of like in the way we hear in modern music with Billie Eilish, where it's this kind of a whisper tone, very gentle and intimate. Sounds like it's directly in your ear, but at the same time, it can be massive and super loud. And we're using compressors to achieve this kind of technique. Let's go ahead and move on from there. Close that out. So when we look at the piano, we start with the synthesizer. That was the mini grand. This gave us our sound. We found that by putting its master volume at plus 10 and a half dB, that allowed our trim reader to be able to hit here at negative 10. And it looks like we had a little dip at 2.8 dB. Again, this was in relation to episode one when we were testing this gain stage volume at the very beginning of the piano where the loudest dynamic moment happens. When we're doing this part of the gain staging process, you want to make sure you find the loudest part of your song, go ahead and loop it, and then see where those levels are sitting. Always work with the loudest part of your song and make sure that that's where your biggest peak is happening. Again, with us, we're doing the target of negative 10, and it's going to fluctuate. Again, this is a piece of classical music. It's not meant to pump at one volume level. It's meant to have this kind of dramatic volume change. So now we go ahead and add our next effect. So we're back to that question. Are we doing EQ first, or are we going to put compression on? It's going to be case by case. It's going to be part of your taste as well as the context that this instrument's going to be in. In our situation, with this piano, I happen to like the synthesizer as it is. It's got a nice full-bodied range. The lows to high have a nice stereo imaging, so I don't actually want to mess around with too many of those EQ effects right now at this stage. So I'm actually going to use the compressor to help bring out some of that great dynamic sound and bring it up with the same closeness that we have that bass clarinet. I'm also going to add a little bit of the pump to it by playing around with a shorter release time. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Dynamics, we're going to go back to the R compressor again. This is the Renaissance compressor from Waves. And the reason I want to use the same compressor on both of these instruments is because I want it to act as kind of like a sonic glue. Even though both of them aren't running through the same compressor at the same time, they're going to have a similar quality to them. It's almost like using the same seasoning on two different dishes. We're going to be able to have a similar sound quality while still being able to manipulate some of the individual parameters of that effect on both of these instruments. Later, we're going to take a look at that same technique in terms of mastering when it comes to putting a compressor or a limiter over an entire track and seeing how that affects the entire piece of music rather than the individuals. So let's go ahead and mute the bass clarinet for just a moment. We're going to listen to this piano part with the compressor, making some adjustments just to hear its perceived volume change. And we'll bring that bass clarinet back in to make sure that it's sitting properly within the reality of the context of this music. So let's go ahead and take a listen here. So I'm starting to like that. We're getting a nice punch out of the piano now, but we're also starting to get a little bit more of a bump out of the low end that we might want to come back to now that we've gotten the entire sound amplified. So taking another listen, making sure we're hitting this negative 10, and we're going to see that some of the volume here is still living a little bit further below, but we're going to go ahead and leave that because we'll be able to make some of those adjustments as we're adding more plugins along the way. So listening back to this piano with the compressor on it, I'm starting to feel that we're getting this really nice punch from the low end and the, and the high end is also starting to sit very comfortably up in the mix. But keep in mind, we've been working on this within the context of a soloed and isolated piano part. Let's bring the bass clarinet back in and see where this volume level is sitting once we put our lead instrument back in. We may find that we need to turn it down a little bit. So we're going to go here, unmute the bass clarinet, let's take a listen with both parts together and make any adjustments that we need to at that time.
Okay, so we're going to go ahead and leave that as it is, and let's move on to another effect. I'm going to close this out so we can work with some of this space down here. Underneath there, let's go back to the multi-channel plugin, but I want to throw a curveball. Instead of going for the EQ this time, let's go ahead and do something a little out of left field. Let's go down to Harmonic and down here to Sans Amp PSA1. This is a stock plugin that comes in with Pro Tools. Remember, if you want to have both of these plugins available to be able to see at the same time, hold Shift and click that other plugin. We'll keep an eye on our compressor while we're making adjustments to the distortion effect. So now the next question may be, why are we putting a distortion effect on a piano? It's a classical piece of music. We're not trying to do anything completely out of the box, but why would we use a distortion effect when we may want to have played around with the EQ? For example, we have the bass end that's a little bit louder now, now that we've added this compressor, and maybe we want to relax that a little bit. We can also do that within this distortion effect. But what we also want to look at is using some of these other factors, such as the preamp, the buzz, punch, crunch, and drive, as well as these EQ frequencies with the low end and high end. Let's take a listen and mute the bass clarinet again, make some adjustments on the piano, and then bring that bass clarinet back in to make sure the changes we made fits within the context of the song. For now, we're going to overdrive it and we're going to dial it back. So by using the distortion effect as an EQ, we basically just gave this piano a different character, another color, a, a unique personality that it wouldn't have had otherwise. So in the realm of music, we're just experimenting here and we're playing around with what kind of plugins can be used and in what order they can kind of have an effect on this music. And again, none of this means that you have to do it following this way. We're just experimenting. We're going through the process and showing what's possible using Pro Tools and adding some effects while we're here in the mixing stage. So let's look at our next plugin. We're going to go back to multi-channel plugin. We're going to go down to delay. What I want to look at here is just a simple delay effect. We're going to overdo it and so it's got this massive echo and we're going to dial it back so that it becomes a nice gentle reflection of the sound, which starts to introduce us to why we'd be then going to a reverb unit. So taking a look here in delay, we're going to go to dynamic delay right here at the top. Again, this comes with Pro Tools as a stock sound. Holding Shift, I'm going to click to keep this distortion just in line. We don't have to do any changes here, but we are going to keep an eye on it just so that we can get familiar with what our effect chain is looking like. So let's go to Factory Default. These are some presets they already have built in. We'll go with an eighths delay. You'll see that this eight is going to sync to our time code here all the way at the beginning. We're at 54 beats per minute. The feedback is going to be how long that echo is going to be going for. At this point at 100%, that's infinity. We're going to definitely be scaling it back, but we will start there. I'm not going to play around with any of these other settings from the preset. We're just going to be looking at the feedback, the mix, and I'm going to put that at stereo so that the sound takes up the entire sonic space. 
Working with the mix and the feedback, let's take a listen to just this piano part and see where this delay is going to sit. So using this delay and dialing all of this feedback and mix way down, it gives it a very subtle room ambiance. Again, this is just a delay effect that's basically an echo. But if you manipulate the sound properly, you can actually get it to sound kind of like how a reverb unit would sound. Now, we're not going to be using the delay in this case. We want to have both of our instruments running into the same kind of reverb unit so they sound like they're playing in the same room. I'm going to go ahead and bypass this and just go ahead and shut it off. So now we look at our piano reverb. If we go back here to the top of the inserts multi-channel plugin, we go down to reverb and we're going to use this one called space. We can shut down these other plugins for now. So this reverb unit space isn't necessarily a stock plugin with Pro Tools, but it does come with Pro Tools when you purchase it. And you just go online and you download it from there. What's really awesome about this reverb unit is that it is designed to mimic actual spaces around the world. So one of these spots I want to look at here in the concert halls, we're going to drop down to Concert Gebouw, which is a concert hall in Amsterdam. So by loading this patch up, again, we're going to keep that piano isolated so that we can hear these effects, but we will be bringing that bass clarinet back in and making sure that all of these volumes and effects we've added are sitting comfortably. But before we do that, let's take a listen to this piano part, and I'll make some adjustments here in terms of the wet effect, the dry audio, the decay, that is the reverb tail. We'll take a look at the inputs and outputs as they reflect here in the volume reader, and we'll look at some of these early and late reflections. These are, again, this kind of gets back into that delay concept. This is going to be when the sound hits off the back of the wall and comes back to you, the listener. So it's amazing what we can do these days in terms of control with these various plugins. And we're not even going to touch the delay, early reverb, and decay aspects of what this plugin can do. We are just looking at the levels. So let's listen to the piano now, making adjustments to just these main core functions.
So that gave us a little bit more of a room ambiance. Now, I kept it on the drier side. I didn't want it to sound like this piano is just being completely lost in this auditorium. And the reason I make that kind of a decision is because here in the modern world with how we listen to pop music, so much of the music is right up in front of us. It sounds like it's directly in our ear. It's not so far and distant like it would have been back in older recording days where we may have just had microphones set up in the back of the room or even at some live concerts where someone is just bootleg recording a performance. So in this context, I I wanted to keep this piano part, which is the same thing we're going to do with the bass cornet. We're going to keep it a little dry so it sounds like you're actually almost standing on stage with them rather than being all the way at the back of the auditorium. So now let's switch to the bass clarinet. We're going to copy and paste this plug-in across and then play around with some of those parameters and see if we can get these instruments sounding like they're on the same stage but perhaps in a little bit of a different place. So now in Pro Tools, we want to copy this reverb from the piano and put it on the bass clarinet. First, let's go ahead and close out this distortion effect. We're going to hold Option on the Mac keyboard, click the Space plugin, and pull it over and drop it onto the bass clarinet's reverb channel. So now, holding Shift, I've got the bass clarinet reverb down here with the pianos up top. We'll have the piano be on the auditorium picture, and we'll leave this one with just the description here as the bass clarinet. So, Right now, it's going to be a copy of the exact same effect. And by having these two instruments play with the exact same reverb effect, that's going to give it a very cohesive sound, like it's being played exactly on top of each other. But what we're going to do is play around with some of these parameters so that it makes it sound like the bass clarinet and the piano are a little bit different in terms of their depth. So I'm only going to make adjustments to these levels here. And let's take a listen with our bass clarinet and our piano playing together now. But keep in mind, now that we've added some of these other effects, now that we're having the two instruments playing together, we might need to make some changes. There may have been something within that distortion or within the compression of the piano that sounded good on its own, but it won't work now that the bass clarinet's in there. And now it's running through a reverb unit. So all of these factors come into play, and it, just because we made one move sound good in one place doesn't mean it's going to sound good down the line. We always have to be conscious of the entire totality of our track. So now let's take a listen with this bass clarinet playing. They're at the same place here on the levels, and they'll sound like they're coming from the same room. So I'm pretty happy with where this reverb is sitting. Again, I started with something a little more dry, but then once I brought the bass clarinet in, I thought, well, I think I want a little bit more body coming out of the room, a little more resonance. And I actually did that with the bass clarinet, even though it's our lead. I gave a little bit more of an early and late reflection in the bass clarinet as opposed to the piano, which gives that instrument just a little bit more of that reverb tail. I kept the piano a little clean, which to us as a listener, might have been like we're sitting a little off to the stage where the piano is a little closer to us and the bass clarinet could be a little further away. In any case, 
it's just like we'd be using in a pop vocal. We give it just a little bit of that reverb so that it has a nice soaring quality to it without being totally overwhelmed or drowned out by the reverb sound. So I'm happy with that. I want to listen again now and start listening to everything, start bringing in some of these effects and start kind of massaging the general color of the entire piece. So now that we're moving on to the balancing of all of these plugins that we've added, let's talk about another mixing technique. And this is using headphones as opposed to monitor speakers. When we listen in headphones, we get the sound to go straight to our ears. So this is going to give us immediate sonic impact, but it's also going to be a little misleading because it's not going to be necessarily what it sounds like in a big open space. So in the question of whether to mix in headphones or on speakers, there may be a little combination of both depending on your situation. In our case, I like doing a little bit of mix on the speakers to kind of get the room sound, but then when I do a general balance like we're about to do, I'm going to go into headphones, make sure I've got the lead instrument sitting just on top of that accompaniment, and then once I feel comfortable there, remove the headphones, take another listen to the speakers, and make some final little adjustments because the reality is I'm going to be listening to this within the context of a space. Your audience might be different. Some may listen to just headphones, and you may want to cater your music towards that kind of a demographic. If your audience is going to be more concert going or listening on big sound systems, then you want to make sure that you make your final mix be fit for monitor speakers. So again, it's one of these, a little bit of both is going to be the way to go. In this case, let's switch to the headphones, do a little bit of balancing in terms of all of the plugins we've done. Then we'll remove the headphones and take one final listen, and then that'll set us up for our final episode in terms of the music production on this Moonlight Sonata session, getting into mastering. So let's get the headphones and give this another listen. Okay, again, what I'm looking for here is the right balance where the bass clarinet is going to sit on top of the piano as the main melody with the piano having just the right support. With the headphones, I'm going to be listening to the stereo image of the piano, making sure that the low end bass here off to the left and the high end treble that's off to the right is going to sit comfortably out of the way while the bass clarinet lands right there in the middle. With the headphones, we'll be able to hear the tail of the reverb and make sure that it's not bleeding over into the track. We can do that within headphones and we might miss that in speakers. But in any case, let's get into this. Let's take a listen and make some massages to the sonic qualities as we're going through this part of the listening session.
Okay, I'm pretty happy with that in terms of its balance. So the next stage, we're going to look at the VU meter here on the master volume. So if we open up VU, we're going to be watching all of these volume levels here entering our submix that then enters this master. Our aim is between negative 10 and zero. If it goes over, this can push it into the red. It could lead to distortion. Now, in this track, we've got a lot of dynamic range. So, of course, it's not going to be really easy to pin just saying, ah, that's zero. We do want some of our climaxes to hit negative one or zero on this VU meter. But it's going to be OK that this whole range has motion. Again, this gives us more opportunity when we enter that mastering stage to do even more volume adjustment. Now let's take one final listen, make sure we've gotten all of the mix in the balance sitting where we want it, keeping an eye on this submix to make sure that we're staying within the negative 10 and zero range. Again, we're keeping an eye here on the submix level, as well as the bass clarinets reverb and the piano level, just making sure everything is sitting comfortably. So now that we've got a nice level sitting here between negative 10 and zero, this leaves us in great shape to get into our mastering episode for next session. But let's take a look at the plugin that we're going to be starting with in that episode. Under the VU meter on the master channel, go to multi-channel plugin, down to sound field, at the bottom, WLM plus. This is also another plugin from Waves Audio, and this is a loudness meter. The loudness meter gives us the ability to monitor the short-term volume, long-term volume, momentary peak, true peak, as well as adjust the gain on the overall level of the entire track. This becomes really helpful when we're looking for a new target volume level. And check out what we can do here. We go to the load button and we see a whole bunch of presets that Waves has already preloaded into this plugin. Down at the bottom, we look at YouTube and Spotify. And we'll use this preset as an example for our mastering session. We're going to be looking at how to hit a target of negative 14 dB. Now that we've had our entire track sitting very comfortably within the VU meter and we've already had our targets of negative 10 on our individual instruments and their effects, we'll use this plugin to help not boost this sound here, but actually just the final volume down here at the gain. Because this plugin occurs after the VU meter, what we do down here will not affect the volume that's happening up here. So now that we've gotten this in a very comfortable sweet spot, we'll be able to adjust the gain and the overall loudness of the track using this kind of a loudness meter. So now we're going to be talking about this a bit more when we get into mastering, and it's a huge subject. We're only going to be scratching the surface, if that. We're going to be talking about techniques that mastering engineers would be using to look at an entire piece of music and basically give it those final touches, just that extra bit of magic that makes a track so special, as well as makes it be able to perform well at the same audio level and presence on any platform that the artist decides to release it on. So we're going to be looking at this plug-in here using the WLM loudness meter so that we can achieve this new target volume of negative 14 dB, the ideal volume for both YouTube and Spotify. Okay, that's it for now. Next time, we're going to take a stratospheric view of our work. When it comes to the mastering process, think of it like an artist of color correction. The line between color correction and color destruction can be thin, difficult to perceive, and has perhaps the largest impact on the overall presentation of the artwork. This technique has the power to stimulate the senses as well as dull them to complete lifelessness. This step in the artistic process is the final touch before making a public display. The final stage in Moonlight Sonata will be looking at our recording as if we are sitting on the moon looking back at Earth, viewing the totality of our sonic ecosystem and identifying areas of improvement and where we might be able to enhance its brilliance. Now, mastering won't save a lousy mix. Just like mixing won't save a truly lousy recording. While it's not a safety net, mastering a mix can help restore the sonic balance by treating outlier frequencies such as cutting the volume of a boomy low end or boosting the level on a hollow mid-range. The trick is to begin with the end in mind. At the mastering stage, we become even more objective about our music. We evolve into scientists of the sonic spectrum. 
Admittedly, this is a serious subject in music craft. We won't be doing a legit deep dive into mastering. But we will take a look at why mastering is the magical and necessary final touch to finalizing an audio recording, and we'll review some philosophies from prominent Grammy-level mastering engineers. Until next time, I've been Jonathan. Keep creating.